Yeah, good morning, everyone. Uh, good to be back in, uh, in Rotterdam after three years. I was there back in October, but we were really less people than today. Uh, very pleased to be with you all. For the one who doesn't know me, I'm Pascal Olivier. I'm chairing the, uh, the, World, Port, uh, com, uh, the World Port Association, IAPH. I'm the chair of the uh, Digitalization Committee. And today, for cybersecurity purpose uh, of the theme of that session, we, we have two speakers, uh, Gabriel from Siemens House, and also Cronis, who is somewhere uh, on a video uh, remote out of London right now. Uh, with the, uh, with the um, security forum ISF. Um, just to put um, the context into perspective of, of today's session. So here is Cronus. Hi, Cronus. Um, we, in 2019, at Talk Europe, uh, we had some meetings uh, at World Port Association and, uh, and along with the industry and said, what's going on on cybersecurity following the 2017 Merck's uh, case? And we decided from a port terminal and from a also port authority perspective to deep dive on this and to see what we should do on our side. So um, a few weeks after we met with Cronis and others from LA, from Rotterdam and Singapore, uh, we met in, in, in London during the International Shipping Week. And we said, you know, we're gonna start a first initiative. And the first initiative that we released uh, in June 2020 was to focus at the port community level on cybersecurity. We recognize that at the port authority level, they were starting to work on it, uh, but they were saying, you know, when we talk to our stakeholder private sector, nobody want to talk about it. You know, it was like, oh, it's classified, you know. So, so we started to publish at, at the World Port uh, Association, uh, really a first paper in June 2020 about awareness of the importance of biosecurity for critical infrastructure at the port community level. Uh, then we moved to a second stage. We, we started the discussion with the IMO and said, we've, you know, back in 2017, the IMO started to work on cybersecurity uh, with BIMCO. Uh, BIMCO has released the first uh, guideline for cybersecurity on ships in 2015. That was a release 1.0. And, and they were endorsed by, by IMO, which make it, you know, uh, like a uh, guideline slash mandatory uh, out of January of last year uh, for the first inspection that you need to be compliant with the guidelines of the IMO and BIMCO on cybersecurity at ships. Still today on, on ships, uh, it's not there. Uh, most of the time, fleets are maybe 30 to retrofit, 30 to 40%. There are still lots of uh, to be done on OT. We're going to be with Gerben talking about OT later on. Um, so we, uh, we started our journey with the IMO and said, you know, we want to upgrade, the I we want to hammer the ISPS code. That, that was the start of the discussion. And why we wanted to do that from a Port Authority perspective, we thought that, you know, that cyber was not defined within the ISPS code. And the ISPS is the only way, as you all know, to enforce things, uh, you know, uh, along member states. Um, the reality is amending ISPS codes was a very long journey because ISPS has been ratified by all governments, all parliaments, and laws most of the time, not only regulation. And um, a long six months of discussion with the IMO, we said, you know, what we did with BIMCO was very good because as of January 21st, you know, inspection uh, need to review the cybersecurity at ships. So we want to do the same thing with ports and port terminals. So we said, okay, that was in February of last year. And, and, and the deal with the IMO said, you know, if you want to do it, you have to go fast because we are organized through our Maritime Safety Committee and our file committee. And anything we put onto guidelines, you know, we need to have approval from all member states. So we set up a team at IAPH, uh, a team of 22 people uh, from Singapore, PSA, DPW, Jabal Al Ali and, and Rotterdam and Los Angeles, Port Authorities and so forth, to a team of 22 experts on cyber, both at Port Terminals and, 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 and also at Port Authorities. And we came out in September with the first ever guidelines for Port Authorities and Port Terminals on what is a business case for the C-suite, not from a tech perspective, but really for the C-suite, how to get organized at a port authority and a termi global terminal operator level on moving to cybersecurity. 
We file at the same time with the IMO uh, in July of last year. Uh, we went through the MSC committee, the Maritime Safety Committee in October. It was validated at the MSC uh, committee with all member states, with strong support from Dubai and from Singapore, among others, and from EU as well. And we just went to a, a last phase of, of validation with the file committee of the IMO uh, early, uh, early of May. So that means that the IPH guidelines for port and port terminals are going to be over summertime, including in the IMO cybersecurity uh, framework, like the BIMCO are. So today, what we're going to be doing now, that setting that into context uh, with, with Cronis and Gabriel, we're going to see how we can you know, move to next steps in terms of implementation uh, from an OT perspective with Siemens and also with, with Cronis from a port and, and port terminal. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to ask uh, Cronis, who is out of London today, just to introduce himself and after Gerben. Cronis. Hello, everyone. Hopefully you can all hear me. Uh, Pascal, uh, thank you for setting the scene. It has been a pleasure to participate in some of the journey some of the steps of the journey that you described. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm really sorry that I'm not able to be there. Uh, but as you can see, I'm not feeling very well. Uh, my name is Kronis Kapalidis. I'm a principal at the Information Security Forum. And I'll tell you a bit more about uh, our organization in a bit. But regarding myself, I'm an ex-Navy officer. I was a Navy officer in Greece for 18 years, where I was uh, doing operations. But also, I was a CISO, a Chief Information Security Officer. Um, and then when I left the Navy, I started conducting research, some of the results you will see during my, my presentation, uh, and worked for a few consultancy organizations, and now I am here supporting this uh, really important discussion. Thank you, Cronis, for your introduction. Gerben. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm Gerben, uh, working with Siemens since uh, 2000. Um, started off as a commissioning engineer for uh, cranes, been traveling around the world, um, have done a uh, degree in logistics meantime and a uh, mechatronics background and from uh, commissioning engineer slowly moved up in the organization and now leading the sales team for the project house integration for cranes. Yeah, thank you, uh, Gavin. Before we move in it to the respective presentation, we uh, you know, I did introduce to you, you know, the landscape with the IEPH guidelines uh, that we're discussing today in their implementation. At the same time, uh, we all know that since the beginning of the years, the situation is getting more and more critical for the one who are very much involved in, in that day-to-day uh, -day cybersecurity issues. Uh, we have been moving from a ransomware to a ransom war uh, issue on moving to political states and influence just to destroy critical infrastructure. It's not, you know, you know, a ransom that you want to get make out of money out of it, but it's moving really to more political environment. So it, it is really is getting worse. Uh, we had a meeting yesterday with some key CEOs of ports uh, in Paris, where I'm coming from this morning. Uh, the situation is not good on a global perspective and you all know this. So uh, it's why we, we want to discuss, and after we get the two presentation, we'd like to have a collective session on, you know, really very uh, collaborative in discussing uh, about that with the experts. Uh, so Cronis, I give you the floor first, and after we move to Gernon. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Pascal. And that is a very key point that you mentioned there, that we need to realize what the reality is nowadays, and we need uh, to adapt and uh, move forward. But uh, before I start, let me tell you a few things about the ISF, as I mentioned previously. So the Information Security Forum is a non-for-profit organization um, based in the UK, but it's a global organization where we try to bring together our members to discuss challenges about information security and risk management. Uh, and obviously, a lot of our members are in the transport sector, so we try to connect all of them in order to be able to support the industry and understand what are the next steps that we should take, very similar to what we, we, ha we have been talking about so far. But without further ado, the agenda is as you see here. But I would like to set the scene before we go into the, uh, into the details of the discussion, because cyber is just one of the elements that you're discussing there in Rotterdam today. So let's look at cyber seas as a concept. And it's very interesting, and I'm proud of that as a Greek, that cyber is actually uh, originated from a Greek word, the Greek word uh, kybernetes, 
which means the, hel the helmsman or the ship's pilot. So it is very interesting because we should be able to understand how we can navigate in this new cyber seas environment. Obviously, many, many years ago, navigation was very different. But nowadays, we use a lot of digital solutions, which also introduce threats. At the same time, when the ships call into ports, they sometimes require a lot of connectivity in order to continue with uh, uh, offloading, but also other processes if we're talking about passengers. So that element of an interconnected environment, the port community environment that Pascal talked about, which I will touch upon at the end, is very important and something we should keep in mind. But let's try to understand when we started thinking about cyber. Well, the World Economic Forum in its annual report, it was only in 2019 when it included cyber attacks at the top right quadrant there. So very high likelihood and very high impact of something happening. And it also identified a rising cyber dependency. So things are going to become worse. If you look at the recent WEF reports, cyber attack is not there, but there are about 10 different threats related to cybersecurity. So just by that, you can see how the maturity of the world, uh, the, the global industry has evolved, because we're not talking just about cyber, but we actually understand what the different risks are. But let's go to our sector specifically. And when you look at maritime, I don't like to break it down to uh, ships, ports, and different elements, but it's important to talk about maritime supply chain. So a key question that I get asked a lot in a lot of events that I am with Pascal is that, is our industry a target? Well, the very simple answer is, look at this table and you will see that the industry has been, still is, and will continue to be a target. And I'd like to draw your attention on the bottom right there, where you see the events up until the end of last year. There have been so many incidents, both port related, but also shipping related, that are not so well known. So we need to be able to understand that, unfortunately, maritime cyber incidents for the industry is now something very common. And if you just look at this uh, slide, you will be able to correlate uh, with that claim. But an important element is for us to be able to understand what the exposure actually is. This is the piece of research that I mentioned that we carried out with a team of 15 experts uh, when I was at Chatham House a couple of years ago, where we tried to break down the port environment into components and subcomponents. And we tried to identify the vulnerabilities, the consequences from a cyber incident, but also the domains that were impacted in terms of data, environment, human and physical. Uh, this presentation will be available to you, but if you want to learn more about this piece of research, please uh, do reach out to me directly. Another very important piece of research that was published again in 2019 looks at supply chain cyber risk. And this is the Sen attack scenario developed primarily by the University of Cambridge along with others, uh, other research organizations and insurance organizations. And it looks at the impact of a cyber attack on 15 Asian ports. And you can see there, I don't know if you can read the numbers, but it says the scenarios, the different scenarios that were examined they look at a total cost of from 41 billion to 110 billion from cyber attacks to 15 ports, which in the scenario start from one infected terminal on board a vessel. And you can also see what the impact is, not only to our industry, the transport sector, but all the different sectors here. And also, if we try and break that down into regions, it's very interesting that we are realizing, as you can see on the graph, that it's not only Asia where the ports are based that is affected, but it is also more or less across the world, even in the Caribbean, there are losses from this specific scenario. So this is again to explain how the interconnectedness of our sector uh, is affected by uh, any cyber risks that we have to deal with. But obviously we had to deal with the pandemic like the entire world and we had to continue operating. We had to have our people at ports, but we also had to have our ships uh, moving around the goods that were necessary in order to tackle the pandemic, but also continue our living. So when we worked with a lot of organizations, we tried to apply technology solutions in order to support transition from working in the office to working remotely. These are just some examples. I'm not going to expand too much, but we had a problem. 
we had the problem of people working from home in an environment like you see here on the graph. But we also looked at some research that was carried out and we noticed that 65% of the people that were working from home were not trained to work from home. 25% were not using updated devices and 23% were using their own devices. But also, some of them were sharing these devices with the family. Well, I can tell you this percentage is probably much higher than just 10%. But at the same time, if we look at our workers in the port environment, they had issues as, as well in regards to cybersecurity. 80% believed that cybersecurity was not their responsibility. 75% required more connectivity as they were spending a lot of time in their operational environment to be able to communicate with their loved ones to see how they're dealing with the pandemic. And 60% had not received any sort of cyber training. So if we put all that in the mix, so it's not only technology that we had to adopt, but also be able to manage the two sides of the coin during such a very difficult period like the pandemic. So are we prepared? Are we equipped with the right skills in order to deal with the pandemic? Well, the answer is very interesting. These are some results that came out from a research where we looked at 100% of large organizations said they were prepared, 99% of medium organizations were prepared, and 6% of small organizations were prepared. But there is an oxymoron here, and the oxymoron is in this graph. So what you see here, the first question on the top left is, do you believe that the maritime industry is well prepared for cybersecurity? 69% said yes, which is good. 31% that is said that the industry is not prepared, which is acceptable. But at the same time, the same people were asked, do you believe that your organization is well prepared in cybersecurity? And the numbers are the exact opposite. So that is very interesting. We have the mindset that our colleagues are looking after our butts, but we, are within our own organization, are not taking the necessary steps in order to protect uh, our business. And I think the initiatives that started about two years ago, led by IP8, are actually paving the path for the port sector and the terminal operators specifically in order to know what they have to do. So we can match these numbers more towards the preparation side of things. So where do we start? This is a very uh, easy list to look at. Obviously, it links with the IP8 guidelines, but there are specific steps that have to be taken in order to protect our organization. I'm not going to expand on that much, but I would like to leave you with one final comment. And again, this is described in the Port Community Cybersecurity White Paper that Pascal mentioned that was published, um, I think, about uh, two years now. And that specific paper looks at who owns responsibility for cybersecurity. And I think that is the first and foremost, the most fundamental question which does, because we all have our everyday jobs in our uh, environment where we operate and we often neglect cybersecurity. And we most, in most cases, we turn to our IT people and say, cybersecurity is your responsibility. Well, ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you that that's not the case. Everybody has a role to play within an organization when we're looking at tackling cyber risk. It starts from the shareholders, the private equities, the partners, the SIP owners or the terminal owners, where you need to evaluate and fund the risk. The first thing to do is understand the risk, evaluate it, but then fund it. It goes to the board of directors, when again they have to do similar activities in order to minimize losses, but also support and protect the uh, investors of the specific entity. It goes down to business leaders, where then now they have to manage the risk by looking at profit and loss, by looking at their balance. Further down in the organization, we look at risk leadership, where we need to be able to identify, prevent, accept, and transfer risk, manage risk, and treat risk as we should at that risk leadership level. Also, we need to look at security leadership, and finally, all the security practitioners within the organization. So I believe you can easily see and relate and understand how we all have a role to play in this journey. And I'd like to close by showing you this specific graph, which is a very interesting one because it illustrates the positions of ships which were supposed to be in uh, the canal, in the river that you see here on the left, but they are actually transmitted on AIS in mainland. 
So as you can see, it is a new threat. There are new things that are coming up. This was very recently released, and we did identify, we were not able to identify why this happened, but we were able to see what the specific SIPs were, SIPs were. So more threats are coming in, and we should be prepared to deal with them. Thank you so much for your attention. Yeah, thank you, Kronis. I mean, you just pointed out uh, an interesting thing about the port community side. Um, early this year, uh, end of December, the Port of Los Angeles uh, implemented the first of its kind Cyber Resilience Center, uh, which is in a new data collaboration platform to share automatically threats and risk between the stakeholders. So that's include the, the CIA, the FBI, the City of Los Angeles, the key governmental agencies at the Port of LA, but also all the private operators, including the port terminal, the 12 terminals of Los Angeles, to be better organized and due to the amount of intrusion tentative that they have in LA, which is about 40 million a month, which is just huge. It's only you know, 20% of the equivalent of the intrusion tentative on DOD, US DOD. So, it is a reality of the port of Los Angeles. So it's something that we, we can look at and, and discuss later on. But now, Gerben, floor is yours to talk about what Siemens is doing there. Thank you all for being here. Uh, Kronos, thank you very much for the uh, introduction from the, let's say, the, the uh, high side of the, um, of the, the uh, organization. Um, I would like to see, to explain a little bit on, on how we try to implement all the regulations, all the advices that are that are um, uh, here today. So um, I would just like to start with a few questions, and um, please help me from the audience if you have any opinion on this. Um, if you have equipment that is running, what would you say? Would you like to leave it running, or would you say, look, I need to do stuff to upgrade to protect? What would you say? Touch or don't touch? Don't touch? No? So we just keep it running? Yeah? Any other opinions? Don't touch? Touch? Okay. Well, actually, the answer is somewhere in the middle. Um, if you don't touch it, there's the risk that you don't have updates on security on your equipment. So you make you create vulnerabilities. If you update, you have a chance that you have standstill because a patch did not go correctly. So it's somewhere in the middle, and it's somewhere where you need to find your organization to work with and educate on uh, when do you do and when do you don't. So it's an interesting one. Keep it in mind. The thing is, why is it in the middle? At the moment, 90% of the security cases could have been avoided either by touching it at the right moment or leave it as it is and keep the stuff organized. Another one. How long does it take you before you know that somebody has been running around in your system? What do you think? Is it five days? Is it a month? Is it a year? Six months? One week? Oh, you must have a very advanced system in place there. It's around 200 days before in the OT environment things are noted uh, and you can take action on. This number we need to get down. What do you think if somebody would be in your system? What would you be interested in? You know, we, we heard about the ransom war. Um, why would somebody be around in your system? And what would be the, what would be the case for the, the whole business case for the person to be in your system or organization? What do you think? You know, it can be multiple issues. You know, we, we have cases where indeed systems are being uh, uh, captured ransomware, and there are also cases, security cases, uh, they were mentioned also by, uh, by Cronus, um, you know, where um, people are in the system to adapt your, your 
uh, process and are being able specifically on ports are able to pull out containers, for example, without leaving a trace behind in the system. So it's, there are a lot of different aspects on the whole uh, cybersecurity. So how do we go with that? Also, uh, Cronus um, had a picture on there with a, uh, an overview of a terminal. Uh, s several items that, that play on a terminal. You have your, your uh, office environment, you have your yard, you have your key. All of them have their specifics on, on regulation. You know, you have people coming in through a gate. How do you work with that? You have third party uh, uh, vendors working around in your terminal uh, servicing. Many, many uh, uh, aspects that come together on your terminal and all of these aspects you have to have some sort of monitoring on, control on uh, to, to keep your system safe. Then, also mentioned uh, by Cronis was already, okay, so we have the, and also by Pascal, uh, we have IT security in place. And from OT security, there, there are different items that are, that are necessary, different items that are important. You know, if you talk about IT, if you want to run a patch, normally on Friday evening, people go home, IT can upgrade systems in the weekend, and in the morning you come back to office, open your computer, and hopefully everything runs again smoothly. How do you do that with your OT environment? You cannot just patch when you have a 24-7 operations. You need to find your right moments to do it, and it doesn't always go in synchronity with uh, security breaches that are, that are happening. So how do you organize this? It's, it's a different world. Specifically now, with the, the increase of um, automation, more and more data is pushed up through the system. So you cannot just have, uh, let's say, a, a crane um, and keep all the information behind the firewall and say, like, look, from IT perspective, I'll just put a big firewall, nothing will go through from the OT side to the IT side, so safe, secure, nothing will happen. There is more and more information pushed upwards. There is more and more integration on the both systems. How do you get this organized? As said in the bottom of this slide, um, looking at the IT side, we're talking gigabytes. You know, you want to have availability of your system, and as long as you can store your documents, um, and it's done in a fairly rapid speed, you're happy with the system. If you look at the OT side, you want to talk microseconds, milliseconds. Um, it is a totally different way of saying what, what availability am I, am I looking for. So from our perspective, get your OT manager in place, your OT cybersecurity, security, cybersecurity manager in place, and start this as a change management uh, job. You, know, you have to push this in a different direction. Kron has already said training. You know, there are so many people that are not trained properly. It's all part of the, the, the change management that you have to get through on, it, on, on your ports, on your terminals, any system. We look at um, security measures. I'll just put all four of them on the screen. These basically are the steps that were defined over the, the years on a protection level. In the bottom you can read uh, you have protection level one. This is for your script kiddies. These, these are the people that you know, try to get into your computer and uh, you should e easily be, be able to, to keep out of your systems. Second level, hackers uh, up to the, the, the state crime that's happening in level four. Level four would be, let's say, protection of your, your water plants, your, your power plants, you know, your utilities that are of absolute need in your country. Other question for the audience. Where do you think that we, in general, are with our protection level on our equipment? Would that be one, two, three, four? One? Okay. Anybody that says we have everything in place, we're on four? No. Sorry? Three? Sorry? Ah. I, I, I thought you said one, but you mentioned three. Well, we're not there yet. At the moment, at the moment we're, we're somewhere in the two-ish. 
And this is too low. This is too low. Where do we need to go if you look at ports? Four? Yeah? Okay, we expect we need to be at the end of three, at least. And of course, higher regulation can be in place. So, in general, we still have quite some work to do, all of us, to, to get to this, to this higher level. So, um, then, step in a little bit of practical. Um, talk a lot about what can be done. Where do you start? First of all, you have to start and just get a full scan of your terminal. Also mentioned by Kronis, um, you have your full port, you have to do a full scan. Then you can look at how you start to separate uh, several networks, you know, because if you have one full network, one integration means your whole network goes down or your whole network can be in, uh, intruded. You can start off with, with putting ring, ring fencing around. So if you have a camera, security camera system, you can put them on a separate, uh, on a separate network. So if somebody gets into your camera network, that they're at least not going to get through easily uh, onto the, the next levels. From there, with several iteration steps, you come to the, to the last circle, and this is a continuous process. It's a process that, that you will keep, that you will uh, have to keep updating every time. Um, as mentioned also, you know, there's a lot happening, and it's not a question if you will be hacked, but when the next hack is going to happen. And then it's really of importance to make it as difficult as possible for the people to get into your network, so you're the least interesting party to work on. That was the end of my slides. I um, hope that I gave you a little bit of, of overview. Uh, from Siemens' side, we have uh, the, the team in place to support you. Uh, it can be a full process and uh, also always uh, ready to step in at a certain place in the process to, uh, to support ports operators to, uh, to get in place and get up to that high level three in the uh, protection area. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Gerben. There is one interesting thing that Siemens uh, is, a, is a, the workforce on cybersecurity. They have about almost 1% of their total global f workforce as expert on cybersecurity, which means 2000 and plus, you know, uh, something Correct. like this, right? Yeah. So this is very interesting. A year ago, when we were studying on our, um, on our project with the IMO at APH, the UNED's US uh, government announced that on their side, within the government, they were lacking about half million experts only, only, you know, so we can imagine on a global basis. Why don't we talk about all together about the workforce? You know, do you have, you know, do you have enough people? How many people? I mean, do you have a budget to employ experts on cybersecurity? What is the situation right now in, in the different terminal operators that we have around the table? Or do you see, or let me rephrase it, do you see that as an issue today uh, from both from a budget perspective and two, from a, a capacity building perspective? Do you have the right talent to manage the current situation on cybersecurity? Yes or no? Who is saying no? So you're all yes, you're all okay? Nobody want to talk, right? <laughs> it's so-so, right? You know. But okay, let's rephrase it. Do you see that as an issue in terms today of experts, of finding the right talent to address? Yes. Okay. Cronis, Cronis, please. No, I am uh, voting as well. I agree that it is a big problem and uh, it is a problem which also links a lot to the size of its organization. So if we are talking about large ports like the ones that have participated in this initiative, then they have the funding to attract the right people. If it's a smaller port, then the recommendation is potentially look at the outsourcing your capability to defend your digital solutions. Obviously, there are things that have to be taken into consideration, but it tackles, in a way, the problem about finding the right workforce to bring in. 
do you have any specific question you want to address with the expert on, you know, on, on the human element uh, as far as experts are concerned? Yes, please. Hi, thank you. Um, my name is Anthony Ackerman. I'm from Siemens Australia. I mean, I think one of the topics that you both referenced was regards to training. And I, I think this is a super important element because from a, a port terminal operations perspective, you obviously have the cyber threat, but you also have the physical threat of how large and how much infrastructure is actually on the port terminal itself. There are USB ports everywhere. And so the training element, I imagine, is a really big way. I guess my question is, how do you engage with the workforce within the terminal to be able to get them up on um, cybersecurity? Because typically what you see is, you know, and we know we are all of this, that the, the massive talk on, on terminals is about safety. We know this is a huge safety culture. This is a global thing. But obviously cybersecurity is this emerging threat, which I guess could potentially be a safety threat as well. So how would you engage with the workforce in regards to upskilling their knowledge and understanding of the cybersecurity threats? Shall I clear that question? Um, so it's, it's about awareness. You know, um, it's, it's about creating the knowledge of understanding what is happening around you. You know, when you receive an email and you do not trust the sender, just don't open it. It's, you have to start somewhere, it's, it's all about awareness. The training starts with creating from, from, top, to, from top level to, to the, the works on the, on, you know, on the key, um, to get them all aware of what's happening. So if you bring your phone and you say like, hey, I find a USB plug, I'll just plug it in, it's going to happen, you don't know. So you have to get regulation in place and let them understand why you put this regulation in place. Can I uh, expand on that, if I may, Gavin? Yeah, for sure. So uh, I think, first of all, it's a great question because when we talk about cybersecurity and we talk about, when we talk about information security, we need to look at the three pillars. So people, process, and technology, not only technology. Uh, and within the ISF, over the last 12 months, we have run more than um, 12 cyber simulation exercises engaging with more than 170 companies around the world uh, and we have seen that awareness is a big part, but also if you try and bring people together and simulate an incident so they can understand what is actually at stake for the organization is also a very uh, easy way to build that level of awareness. But if we look at staff training because of the question that was asked, and we do have a lot of people in the field working within the port, so it's difficult to bring them all together to do just awareness. What we are recommending is that training should have two pillars. The one is awareness, but the second one is also around the safe and effective use of the equipment that we have introduced, the technology that we have introduced to protect our organization. So it's not only about knowing what the problem is, but also how to use the systems that you have, that the organization has put in place to protect you. And a very simple example is the phishing button on Microsoft 365. It's there, a lot of organizations add it, but they don't inform the people that if they see something malicious, the very simple thing they have to do to report that is by clicking on that specific button. So that's, that's a very simple uh, example to explain what I mean by the two types of training. So we'd like to start to open the floor to, uh, to the audience. Uh, but if you like to address any specific questions. When we launched the guidelines uh, in September of last year at APH, we introduced the five principles of the C-suite business case. And the first one was having the CEO of the company, whatever the size of the company, personally engage on cybersecurity. So I have a question for all of you here, whatever your position is. Is your CEO involved in cybersecurity? Yes? So we have 50%. Uh, is the CEO of Siemens engaged? On cybersecurity, yes. 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 
if you are in charge of cybersecurity in the room, are you reporting to the CIO or are you reporting directly to the executive committee on cybersecurity? So question, are you reporting to the executive committee? Are you reporting to the CIO? Who do you report to? <laughs> okay, no, that's, that's, that's a big question here in Port of Rotterdam. Uh, the chief information cybersecurity officer is directly reporting to the executive committee and to the board of Port of Rotterdam, not to, body, to somebody else. So to be independent, neutral, and it's not an IT or OT only uh, thing. Uh, the second principle of the guidelines were understanding the financial risk and the business risk. We all talk about the issues when it comes to the low OT and, and IT level, of course, but all of us, you know, colleagues in, in port terminal or port authorities, you know, who has attacked knows what the consequence is. But one of the important thing is to understand what is the legal case, what is a financial case, what is a business case. Uh, some of our colleagues had to shut down ports or terminals you know, for days and potentially for weeks, you know, it did happen. So what is the impact uh, of that? At APH, we brought, um, we introduced that last year at a talk in October. We developed on a jurisprudence perspective, the legal case. As of this summer, as Q3, the IMO gonna integrate the guidelines for port and port facilities. So what if, what if, end of this year or next year, you get an attack on one terminal, one port authority, or many? And if suddenly somebody, and it's gonna arrive, it has already arrived, that you have a legal case from one of your customer, from a shipping line, for example, or for a cargo owners, you get a legal case. What did you do? Some of them, some of us, have been forced to declare force majeure. But if we put ourselves in the context that the IMO guidelines on port and port facilities are existing, and that case is going to the court. And the court, in 2023, the judge is going to start to say, sir, did you implement the IMO guideline for ports and port facilities? Yes or no? You can imagine if the port or the port of radio or port terminal is saying, no, we have not, sir. So start the journey on a legal suit. You know, but it's, it's, it's interesting to, to know that it's, it's, we're not talking about from the guideline, we're not talking from a tech perspective. We are talking about getting organized at the C-suite level, at the all aspects of the impact from a business case how many days are we ready to shut, to shut down our operation? Are we ready? Yes or no? What is going to be the financial impact and, and so forth, yeah? But also from an organizational. Uh, Cronis, do you want uh, to piggyback on those two things? Yeah, it's very important because uh, unfortunately we are seeing that a lot of organizations are following a compliance-based approach. So they only do the necessary in order to uh, meet the regulations and they don't really bother more than that. Potentially, in a, a legislative environment at court, that could stand for them and that could work for them. But in reality, would that protect the organization? No. I can give you several examples where, in my previous capacity, we worked with a lot of shipping companies to implement the IMO 2021 regulation that came into force, as uh, Pascal said, in January last year. And a lot of them had that tick, tick box mentality. And it actually didn't protect them when something went wrong. It is important to have that senior leadership buy-in, as mentioned uh, from, I think, everyone in there. But it is also important to understand what is at stake for our organization, what is exactly, as Pascal said, the financial risk, and then based on that, adopt the necessary measures to protect your organization. 
it's very simple. It is exactly, and as the uh, previous um, individual from the audience mentioned, we talk a lot about safety. We know how to handle risk in terms of safety. It's the same thing. It's just a different type of threat. Let's use the things we know. Let's use, for example, the ISPS code and the way it describes dealing with security issues and add cyber in there with obviously more guidelines from the experts like the work that IAPH is doing. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a question of balancing the value and the risk. What is the value of getting organized for our customers versus the risk that we are ready to support? In the team of 22 experts uh, that we had back a year ago, one of the leading, one of the leading colleagues of you, as on, on a terminal operator perspective, said to us, that was at the beginning of the story on March 15 of last year, when my CEO is asking me the following question I'm not able to answer. And the question was, how much enough is enough? Are we investing 1% of our annual budget? Are we investing 2%? Are we investing 3%, 4%, 5%? We don't know. Some of us today in the industry are investing up to 4% of our annual budget in cybersecurity because it's coming too serious on the impact on our businesses every day. So. This is not only about IT and OT, it's also from a financial and, and, and from a legal um, perspective. One subject matter, Garen, that we, that we started to discuss is the, in, 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 the, in the shipping side, on the vessel side, we know that a year and a half after, you know, we are not there yet in OT. You know, we have many fleets who, are, who have not been upgraded or not retrofitted. Because especially in a crisis of semiconductors, the equipment are just not there too, you know. So we had that in Singapore two months ago, we, we had a session on that from a shipping side about where they are. And one of the Asian uh, container shipping lines saying we have about 40% retrofits, our ships. So we have a long way to go. Where do we stand at port terminals? You know, we started to discuss about this. I think it would be collectively interesting to, to deep dive on there. Where do we think that we are in terms of radar fitting OT at terminals? Do we? Yeah, so... Um, from, a from a cement perspective, at least. Yeah, what do you exactly. see from I mean, you are one of the leaders yeah. in the industry. Yeah, exactly. Um, as already showed with the security levels on, this, on the slide, um, we are in the industry around the security level two. There's still a lot that needs to be done. Um, I would say um, if you would scan any given port, you would be able to find enough uh, potential to upgrade. Some of them are low-hanging fruits that can easily uh, drive you up to a, a level three, and some of them will be harder to implement. Um, it, there's a long, long road to go. So let's do a poll here. You know, are we at your terminals? Are we, have you retrofit 30% of equipment to be ready? Are we 60? Are we 100? So what about 30%? Who is 30%? 60%. Okay, let's start. Zero? Have we rear traffic? No. 10%? 20? This is not an auction, right? <laughs> okay, so we're not clear about where we are, you know. Uh, you know, that was interesting, Cronus, on your presentation about Space Canal, you know, uh, spoofing on GNSS and GPS is big, right? So we have the same story on ship as well. So what is your, from a maritime safety perspective from a ship side, where do, where do you see the situation, or at least from your side, on retrofitting ships? I think it is, um, we're not there yet, as you mentioned. Obviously, having been on board a lot of ships for many years, the problem is that we um, unconsciously separate IT from OT. 
IT is dealt by the techies, the technical people, the electronic engineers, and no T is dealt by mechanical engineers primarily. And when you go to them and you ask the question, the very first question that Gaben asked, well, it is working. Are you going to patch it or not? I have been in so many cases where people are saying, no, 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 it's working. Don't touch it. Leave it as is. And then all of a sudden, someone brings in a USB to watch a movie, you know, at the engine control room and everything shuts down. So it is, it's a very interesting discussion when you're looking at these two things. But I think the most important discussion that we should ask at this stage is how much does it mean to your business? And that is how you will probably define what you said, Pascal, how, how much of enough is enough. If you understand what's the value to your business, what can happen if you have an incident that takes down some of your OT equipment, then you will be able to understand how much you should invest in that. Or the most important part is not so much only about prevention, but also about response and recovery. So when something happens, it's not a question of if, but when, as Gavin said, when it happens, how quickly can we go back online? How quickly can we resume operations? And if we look at the MESC incident in 2017, and I had the privilege of working with the CISO of MESC uh, for many years after that, it took them to go, they had to go back to pen and paper to continue operations. So can we do that? Do we have the luxury of doing something like that? It's open to the public to decide. Thank you, Karanis. Question. Yeah, so I think this is a really interesting point because in my experience, I think the terminal operators that I've seen, they're probably at the 30%. They are at this culture of if it works, don't touch it. Um, and I think there is a bit of learning to be done there. But what I'm really interested in is, I guess, across talk, there's a lot of talk about automation. There's a lot of talk about sustainability and electrification. And, you know, long term, what this means is new equipment or retrofitted equipment on the terminal. And so I guess there's a, a question for Gerben is, are you seeing in the projects that you're working on that customers are now starting to specify requirements around cybersecurity for new equipment? Or is this still kind of an afterthought that they're dealing with later? Because I think at the moment, from what I can see is, like you put the process up earlier, the first, I, the first step is like exploration or understanding your network and what your threats are. But from what I can see, maybe this is not really being thought of from a new equipment procurement perspective. You know, is there something that um, terminal operators can do to ensure that the new equipment they're bringing onto their site is actually cyber secure when it's delivered, rather than having to worry about it after it's already operational on the terminal. Yeah, so the, the regulations, um, directives that, are, that I mentioned in the beginning, they're not in place for a long time. So there's still a lot of adaptation inside the terminals. Uh, we do see in the recent tenders that the, the request is there more and more to directly prepare for this whole uh, level three cybersecurity uh, readiness. So this is coming from two sides. One of them is that from your supplier side, uh, you have preparation to get your stuff organized and to understand the installed base and get your patching done from your supplier. Uh, and from the other side, it's also a, an integration and a change management as said from the terminal that you have the right people to talk to at the terminal when you start to, to, uh, to implement new equipment on your terminal. You, know, it's, um, you have security by design and you have the security by, uh, by organization, let's say. Yeah. So one thing that Cronis talked about and, and myself before, it was working together with an ecosystems on cyber and not as a silo or a standalone organization. At the port of Haredi level, uh, we have a group of 15 ports who are fully organized to follow 24-7 what's going on in terms of attacks and how to respond to attacks. Um, and the intel has been developed at this level. Some of us are using some intel sources public and private, to know real time what is happening you know, from Asia to West Coast uh, in the US. Are you organized in, in, in the audience here of working together with others 
in fighting the situation. Are you organized with others? Are you organized at the port community level with other players, port authority, colleagues, shipping lines? So that means that there is lots of room for, to progress, to work, and to collaborate uh, with others. We just encourage you to look at uh, what Port of Los Angeles has been done. You can Google and it's on portofla.org. Uh, uh, it is what they are calling the Cyber Resilience Center. It's the first of its kind. It was kicked off in December um, of 2021. Uh, so this is an automated platform connecting governmental agencies and leading operators like the terminal operator and shipping lines. Uh, very interesting to, to look at and, and what they do um, in that journey. Uh, Cronus, in working with others, of course, ISF, you know, yeah, is, one, is one place to be. Um, how do you see from a European perspective, since we have in Europe, about working with the others? We have ISF, uh, there is... And ESA, but from a maritime, we have potentially also EMSA. How is the landscape, you know, on, on working together with others? Uh, that's, that's a very interesting question because it, it all starts from regulation, to be honest. And uh, I was lucky enough to be part of the team that developed the ENISA uh, Cyber Risk Management Guidelines for Ports a couple of years ago that was published, uh, the document which also has a toolkit available. We are seeing that uh, the European Commission is now trying to coordinate all the different agencies that you mentioned, EMSA in Portugal having the Maritime Mandate, ENISA having the NIST Directive Mandate. They, uh, so far, they have been working independently, but now moving forward, I know I'm in a position to know that the teams are coming together to work together to have a common uh, voice from the EU level. And it is very important to build that as an EU uh, institution in order to support you and other initiatives at the UN level. Gerbrun, from, uh, from a Siemens perspective, uh, you are participating to different uh, forums as well, are you? Yes. Um, as being a, a supplier, um, we also have to integrate with, with other systems. Uh, and we also just use the, the Microsoft uh, uh, computers, for example. Uh, as soon as there is any security issue known, uh, this is reported through the main system. Uh, we have a database with installed base from customers, uh, and we can actively uh, in, uh, inform customers uh, about uh, patches that need to be done uh, and guide them also with these patches and guide them with as said also in the beginning, with a yes or no, if they should implement these patches. So. Well, thank you. Thank you, Gerben. Thank you for Cronis to be uh, with us uh, today, even if you were uh, remote of London. Uh, I think it has been a very interesting chat uh, between ourselves. Uh, there is lots of room for progress wherever we are in one, two, three or four and, and, and beyond. In terms of maturity level, we really have a, a gap for sure, also between uh, the north and the south of our world. Uh, lots of people are just not there, you know, at, you know, at terminals and, and port authorities. Uh, so we, we need to, to move forward uh, definitively. Uh, if you want to know more about the IAPH cybersecurity guideline for port and force facility, just to go to IAPH website and you can uh, download it. It's a very comprehensive document. It's about almost 100 pages. Uh, they are now being integrated in the IMO uh, cyber management framework, uh, indeed, as of this uh, summer. And uh, any please to, uh, we'll be very pleased to collaborate with you if you have any questions and so forth. Thank you. Have a good, have a good talk, Europe.